Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malt House Games Podcast. This is a podcast all about board games, card games, tabletop games, role playing games, dice games, things of that sort, and a good, healthy, smattering, smattering, spraying of beer. And with you today is your lovely wife and yellow player. I hadn't got there. You gave me a weird look and I had to stop. <laughs> my name is Del Tomba, your host today. And with me, as usual, is my, my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Play me something spooky. So this is our Halloween episode. Uh, it technically comes out a few days before Halloween, but that means we still get to say happy spoopy ween. Happy spoopy ween, y'all. We just cracked our beer for the episode. We're both having an identical beer. Because, A, we forgot to pick up other beer. B, it is a beer we haven't had that is October appropriate. And C, we felt like it. Yes, yeah, so today we have... Oktoberfest Fest Beer from Frenzy Brewing Co. here in Edmond. It is a 12-ounce can at a 5.8% alcohol by volume. Uh, there's no other things on the can that uh, talk about any of the flavor profile and stuff, but it is an Oktoberfest as you would expect. Which technically it's a little late in the season for Oktoberfest because I believe it goes from September 15th to about October 15th. But it's October. But it's still October and we're American, so yay. It is definitely that golden amber color. You can see pretty well through that glass, no problem. It's crisp. It's got a nice maltiness to it. It's not too heavy, uh, but they actually have a really good Oktoberfest, I think. Oktoberfests are never my favorite style of beer, but I really like this one. I think the reason why we like this one is because it has a not not heavy, but heavier flavor, and it is 5.8 alcohol by volume. And so typically an Oktoberfest is going to be a little lighter in alcohol because you're supposed to be able to drink it all day. Theoretically speaking, not quite as light as a session beer, but this one has a little bit more weight to it. It does. And so I, I think that's why we like this one so much. I think so. It's got a little more body to it. And so that way, it's uh, exactly as you said, it's not too thin. Uh, it's got a little more of a kick to it, which is what I want out of a beer. You know, it doesn't have a body to it. Your butt. Yes, that's true. I'm a water <laughs> bug. But ghosts. Ghosts don't have a body to them. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to fit in as many spooky jokes and puns as I can this episode. I don't know if that was much of a joke, really, but sure. You love me. Okay. What, what have we been doing this week, Delton? Uh, work. A lot of movie watching. I feel like it's been pretty slow all in all the past like couple weeks. We went to Riley's. Went to Riley's. We got to have a movie day. What did we watch, Delty? Uh, I mean, that's a question that I'm not sure I know the answer <laughs> to off the top of my head. Uh, hang on, because I have my Letterboxd app where I keep track of all the movies that I watch. This is what we get for having a 7% beer literally 30 minutes before we record the podcast. And then another beer here on the podcast. And another beer here. What day was it we went out there? Last weekend. Uh, got it. We watched Monster Inside, America's Most Extreme Haunted House. Do not recommend. Uh, basically, there's a lunatic out there who um, people that want to have extreme haunted house experiences where it's the type where it's like participatory, where you go in and they actually can like kidnap you. But this one guy runs his own almost solo and then later solo and... Uh, he, he's definitely going to go to jail at some point because what he's doing is not okay. And it was actually really hard to watch because you see the actual video footage of him not being kind to people. Yes, they sign up for it, but still he's, according to the lawyer lady that they got that works with Guantanamo? Yes. Uh, that it's, he, he's breaking some laws. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough watch. Uh, we rewatched, at least I got, these are all rewatches for me, Hell House LLC, a great found footage uh, about a haunted house where stuff starts going wrong. Third time's the charm. This is the first time I actually stayed awake for the whole thing. And it was spoopy. It was spoopy. 10 out of 10. Recommend. We watched Host from 2020 that was a pandemic movie filmed all in Skype. Oh, that was fantastic. It's a great uh, it's a great movie. It's just under an hour long, so it's a breeze to get through, but it is super spooky. They did a very good job. I've seen it before. And I also have seen before The Wolf of Snow Hollow, which we love. Uh, Tyler said that he thought it was fine. He liked it, but he found the acting and directing to be kind of jarring at times. And I was like, I don't necessarily disagree because the main guy definitely just has a feel he's going for. 
It definitely, but I like it. It reminds me of stage acting. I can see that. I can see that. It's a little more over the top than it needs to be for movies, at least. But yeah, I think that's all we watched at her house. No, we watched. You forgot the best one that we watched. I didn't count that one because I didn't pay enough attention to say I've seen it because I don't know what the heck was going on half the time because we were playing board games. What were we watching, Delzy? I almost said Sweeney Todd. Uh, <laughs> Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows. Yeah, I need to watch. I need to actually sit and focus and watch it because the first time was when we had margaritas. You threw up and I was too drunk to finish it. I did. The second time for me was here at your sister's where I was more focused on playing the board game than I was watching the movie. Yes, and you're missing out on a classic. Sometime I will watch it at some time. And so, yeah, we went to Riley's last weekend, played some board games, hung out with Delton's parents for a bit. The weekend before, I was actually in Missouri, which is why we record the podcast early. And so went to Missouri with Riley and Lakin, had a grand old time. Mm -hmm. uh, ended up going to Dogwood Canyon, which is a, kind of a nature preserve, I guess you'd say. And I was really proud. Lakin joined me on the first two miles of the hike. And then I finished the rest of the six miles, hiked all the way to Arkansas, made it to the Arkansas border, turned around, came back. Guess what my mileage was, Delty? How fast did I go? I saw it. You remember what it was, though? It was like 14-minute miles when you were by yourself. Yeah, it was. I went 14-minute miles for four miles straight, my friends. She gets those little legs moving. I do. And I went fast, and I went free, and I hiked to Arkansas, promptly turned around and came back because nobody wants to be in Arkansas for more than 30 seconds. But I can say that I went there this last week. But that's really been our week. I also finished up my radio class, so now I need to actually test for my a radio technician license, and that will probably come here in the next few weeks. But until then, we are just going to hang out, try to relax, yeah. and enjoy some spooky time this weekend. We get to have spooky board game day with Brian and Jessica tomorrow on Saturday, uh, as well as do a few other things. Uh, but that's basically the weekend. Um, I don't think we have a lot else coming up, a lot of other things, which is nice. I'm tired. Uh, but is it two weeks? No, Delty, it's next the week. Next weekend, God, next weekend on Saturday, we drive up to Wichita. It's about two hours from here. Uh, we drive up to Wichita to watch AEW Collision on Saturday. That's going to be a great time. We also found out they're coming to Oklahoma City December 20th. For the Christmas episode. For the Wednesday night Dynamite and recording of Rampage, which is their Christmas. Those will be the Christmas episodes. Uh, and of course, we had to get tickets. Uh, I did find out, this is going to be my small rant on how Ticketmaster is a shitty company. Uh, whenever you're buying tickets and they're dark blue and you look and it's like, ah, oh, here's the price. You're like, oh, sweet, cool, works for me. And then you look at tickets that are light blue and it says like premium seating or premium ticketing or whatever. Those are tickets that Ticketmaster themselves buys essentially and then turns the price up based on the demand for those seats. So the front row ramp side seats that I really wanted to get us went immediately. And the next time I looked, they were asking $1,800. I looked later and they went down to $1,200. And then I looked the next day today and they went up to $1,300. And I found out that's Ticketmaster doing a, like a demand, higher demand seats cost more, which really seems like something you shouldn't be doing. That's really shady. So we don't have floor seats like I wanted, uh, because if I'm not front row, I don't want to be on the floor behind people. But we got second row up from the floor on the first level, same area that we uh, we went to AEW last year in Vegas. So they will be good seats. I'm very excited. It's going to be me, Haley, Eddie's going to go, and hopefully maybe somebody else will grab some seats around. It's going to be fun. I'm excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I must say, I agree with the Swifties. Ticketmaster sucks. Yeah. Now you've heard the rest of the story. Delton's looking at me like I'm a goober, but surely there's at least one listener, so I'm not feeling as as a redneck or as backwards or as stuck in 1950s. But there used to be a radio program called The Rest of the Story in which a narrator would tell a story, and it wouldn't be until the very, very end that he name-dropped who it was about, and you're like, oh, that makes sense. And so... Yes, I was trying to do a throwback to a radio program that probably went off the air in the 1970s, but was ran uh, the reruns ran in Elk City until probably 2017. I'm okay without that. Uh, I just did, this is a completely random thing. I did a movie count, because I know Ben's going to ask about my movies, and I told everybody I have a movie list. I am six movies from the end of my list, not including rewatches, 
I have watched 41 new movies this month, which is great, but I have six more to finish my list that I made for myself of getting through all these franchises and their sequels. So I have, excluding the Rob Zombie Halloweens, because I've seen those, I have the last four Halloween movies, Resurrection, and then 2018 Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends, and then I have the last two Screams, which we are currently in the middle of Scream 5, which we'll finish probably after this episode, actually. So that's my movie list update. I can actually uh, give my final thoughts on the different franchises I watched maybe next time if anybody's interested. But uh, that's where I'm at my movie list. So yes, the last two weeks have been full of travel, of hiking, of movie watching, of board game playing. And did we mention playing board games? Oh, here's the door. Uh, uh. It's straight ahead. It's... It's a game. So the game for this episode is one that uh, my good friend, our good friend, Tyler, so graciously gave me a deal on because he was going to either sell it or trade it. And I was interested and he gave me a deal and I paid him for the game and the shipping and he sent it to my house. Uh, and since then, I have played exactly five times, one of which was with Haley. The game I'm talking about today, as you can tell by literally the title of the episode, is Final Girl. Final Girl is a board game that is published by Van Ryder Games. They actually just finished their Season 3 Kickstarter. Uh, they've been... 2021 was Season 1, 22 was Season 2, 23 was Season 3, and I would not doubt if they do a 24 or at least 25 for the fourth season. The game is designed by Evan Derrick and AJ Porfirio. The artist is Tyler Johnson and Roland McDonald. So Final Girl is a solo-only experience, which we will talk more about solo with multiple people later on, but it is a solo game built for one person to be playing against essentially what is a puzzle utilizing strategy to try to combat the luck factor and the difficulty factor of the game, uh, and hopefully coming out on top. The theme of Final Girl is by far the coolest thing about it not that the game is bad because just a spoiler alert i really like this game but the theming is what drew me to it and i love it it's uh absolutely fantastic the game is actually based on a system uh, as i said one of the designers for final girl is aj porfirio and a game that he designed that this is essentially re-implementing the system for is a game called hostage negotiator which is very popular, and I would really like to get my hands on a copy to play. But Final Girl is much more up my alley in terms of the theming. So I'm going to Wikipedia here just to explain. So a Final Girl is something that is a trope within horror movies. Final Girls are generally, if you watch any horror movie, uh, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacres, anything like that, there's generally one person majority of the time it's a female and she is the sole survivor that either gets away or kills the bad guy in the end now obviously it's not a perfect thing but it's a very 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 common trope within horror movies the self uh the term itself which is where wikipedia comes in the term final girl itself was coined by a lady by the name of Carol J. Clover in a book from 1992 called Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film. There are updated versions of this book, which I sent Haley for my Christmas, Christmas wish list, but she suggested that in these films, the viewer began by sharing the perspective of the killer, but experienced a shift in identification to the final girl partway through the film. Uh, so essentially, she described that back in 92, but she did it. Uh, this was, I believe this was a, uh, it was a, dissertation, like a right? dissertation for her doctorate or something like that. Um, but yeah, so it looks like it says she studied slasher films from the 70s and 80s, which are, this says which were considered the golden age of the genre. I might argue that is shifting now. Uh, but uh, define the final girl as a woman who is the sole survivor of a group of people, usually youths, filthy youths who are chased by a villain and who gets a final confrontation with the villain, whether she kills him herself or is saved at the last minute by someone else, such as a police officer, and who has such a privilege because of her implied moral superiority. For example, she's the one who refuses sex, drugs, or other such behavior unlike her friends. That is all from her book. 
And that is a very, very common trope in horror movies, which means you might now immediately surmise that this is a board game all about some kind of horror movie things, which is basically it. In this game, you are going to need a couple different things to be able to play, which really is two. Barnes & Noble now has a starter pack, which I like, but you need the core box, which is just the Final Girl core box, and you need one of what they call the feature film boxes. There are five feature film boxes in each season. So there's totally, uh, completely right now, 15 of them, uh, including the new season that just came out, as well as some bonus content here and there, miniature upgrades if you want, uh, play mats instead of using just the other stuff on the table, all kinds of upgrades, big storage box and stuff like that. What I bought from Tyler was this, basically the season one complete package, everything included, I think aside from the vehicle miniatures, that's the only thing, and the gruesome death books. I think that's the only thing that's missing from it. But to play, you need a core box and one of the different feature film boxes. So the way the game is played is the core box provides you with all your tokens. It provides you with your meeples. It provides you with your action cards you're going to be using for your turns and all of those different things. Each special uh, feature film box is going to include two final girls. So those are the actual playable characters. You get to pick one each time you play. You will pick one, uh, you'll have two final girls in it. You will have a killer and you will have a location that corresponds with that killer. Now, the good thing about this game is you can mix and match final girls, killers, and locations in any combination that you would like, which means you have essentially endless combinations. It's not actually endless, but there is a ridiculous amount of combinations that you can play in this game to provide a different challenge a different killer at a different location might have an advantage or they might be weakened by that other location. And you can mix and match those as you please. But in a single feature film box, you have the two final girls, a killer, and a location. It comes with all the special rules, all the item cards of the location and the killer, all of the, I can't remember if they're terror or horror cards. I think they're terror cards. But all the bad cards for the killer uh, and the location, it has the, those, it has everything included you could need. So the way the game is going to actually function is there's a small board that has different locations on it. There are going to be survivor meeples placed on those locations. There's going to be the killer's meeple placed somewhere. And then your meeple is the final girl placed another place. Each location has so many setup cards to tell you what goes where and how many of e at each place, each with a little scenario. So uh, I'm going to reference because it's the only one I've played so far the first feature film box, which is Horror at Camp Happy Trails, and it features Hans the Butcher, which is very equivalent to your Jason Voorhees, even Michael Myers, uh, a very solitary masked figure who tries to kill you, but this guy has a sledgehammer, which is a little more Leatherface in the beginning. But my favorite scenario, because it's definitely a campground around a lake, I love the setup of the one that's bonfire, and there's just a ton of of survivor meeples all around the bonfire location. So you're like, oh no, because you can also rescue them by getting them to the exits, uh, escorting them along with your movement. And that if you rescue enough of them during the play, you actually get to unlock your final girl's special ability, which is a really cool little aspect. If you help enough people, you're like, I know I can do this. And then boom, you have a special kind of thing, which is neat. But the way the game is going to actually function is with that board, and all these tokens and everything, uh, there are actually going to be a set of cards that provide you with the actions you'll take. You have starting actions, which is going to be a hand of cards, so, and you've got a couple such as walk. You can walk a couple places. You've got a card such as a weak attack, where if you're in the same space as the killer, you can try to attack him and hopefully do one damage to Hans's, I think he starts with like 14 life or 12 life or something. Ridiculous amount when you start with the mere five or six. And you have this hand of cards to do those actions. Then you also have action cards at the end of a turn. If you haven't spent all of your resources, which in this game is time, you could almost look at it like action points. You have so many action points. But the game phrases it as time, which I think works thematically very well because some actions take a lot of time. Uh, however, the better you perform those actions, which means the better you roll to check success, the less time those actions are generally going to use. 
if you don't use all of your time on your turn, you can turn around and buy other cards that cost an amount of time. So let's say you start your turn with six time, you use one time to move somewhere, and you use another time to move again. And let's say you rescue a couple, you know, people, ignoring what bonuses you would get for rescuing them. You've used two cards, and let's say that was two time, you are now down to four time. If you end your turn there, you have four time, which now is effectively a currency, to buy upgraded cards. You could buy uh, one, whatever the reaction card is called, where it allows you to re-roll something in an emergency. You could buy one guard. If the killer attacks you, you have a chance to void all damage. Or you could buy a stronger attack card. You could buy a, a sprint card so you can move further. You could buy a search card so you could try to find weapons or useful items, such as the boat keys or... Uh, what is it? There's a map that lets you jump across the board, all kinds of different stuff like that. And that's going to be how the game functions. On your turn, you'll take your actions until you either run out of time or decide to stop. Every action, like I said, you'll be rolling dice. That's going to be according to a certain track. That track goes up and down, losing dice or gaining dice. Uh, I'll let you figure that part out on your own because it's very uh, stressful when you're not rolling enough dice to have a good chance of success, which is dumb. Uh, but you're going to take your turn until those things happen, purchase some cards, you're going to be discarding stuff. Uh, the cards that you played on your turn go to the discard at the end of the turn. You'll buy new stuff. Then the cards that you had played go then back to the market. So if you use a really good attack card on your turn, it's going to go back to the market and you're going to have to wait until after your next turn, so two turns from then, to be able to pick it up again which means those very strong attack cards or very good defensive cards have to be used in the correct manner or you can really hurt yourself by just going all out, using everything, and then having a turn where you're effectively just not able to do much of anything. You're going to do all that. The killer's then going to take a turn, which is usually moving, attacking somebody, and then flipping a card over and either moving and attacking some more or doing something else. In this first feature film box, which is, again, the horror at Camp Happy Trails. Uh, was that right? Or, no, I can't remember. Camp Happy Trails. Uh, my brain's blanking on it all of a sudden. Uh, it's very basic. The killer is tanky. He hits hard, and he takes a lot of damage. He hits harder the longer the game goes on and becomes very overpowered very quickly. But all he is is just a murder weapon with no bonus abilities. The other boxes that I have not dived into dived dove i have not gotten into Joven. the dr dr uh, drive it in. i have not drive it into those boxes have more complex rules with different things going on uh that i'm very excited to explore and get into i was hoping to be able to have time this week to do that for this episode but i actually think it works out being able to talk about one because then it kind of leaves you to explore them if you would like but that's effectively how a turn is going to work uh, the whole game's going to run that way until either you lose all your life and die or the killer does. But wait, there's one really neat little feature that I'll talk about before uh, I get to how the dice rolls work, because those are interesting. When you lose all of your life or when the killer loses all of theirs, the final life token is not a physical wooden piece of token. It is a little like punch, you know, cardboard punch out token. You're going to give the killer and yourself one of those at random out of a set of nine. Three of those have more health. One has one health, one has two, and one has three. So there is a chance, just like in the movies, that you think the killer's dead, but oh wait, no, he's still alive. Or you think the final girl's been killed, but oh no, wait, she's still alive. And those moments are very fun and frustrating in the game. I thought that was a very cool thematic feature that fits really well with a lot of horror movies and just the tropes that happen in them. So that's something I think is really interesting with the life loss and stuff. Um, but then the other thing I was going to point out is the dice that you roll. Generally, you'll roll two. If you're lowering the terror, you roll three. If your terror is in a very high place, you're only going to roll one, which is bad for successes because most require two successes for the good result, one for the okay result, and no successes is going to be generally a bad or a kind of punishing result. Uh, but what happens on those dice, there are two faces blank, two faces that are successes, and there are two faces that have basically two cards, two rectangular symbols on them. Any time that you roll those dice and one of them comes up as those two card side, the double card side, 
you can discard two cards from your hand to make it a success. And that provides you with some really interesting decision spots where you're rolling for something you really need, like you're searching at the, let's say you're searching at the dock and you roll one success and you roll one of those double cards. You're like, well, I could either take the top card, which I can see is an energy, energy drink, which does whatever it does. Or if I discard two cards, I can make it where I get to draw it and the card below and pick which one to keep. So you have a better chance at getting, let's say, the boat keys that allow you to ride the boat across the pond. And it just uh, it's a it's a pretty neat way to make it work because it makes you really think about, OK, I don't have many cards in hand. Do I want to risk rolling for this action or should I save my cards, wait, save my time, buy more cards and then have the ability to have some to chunk to upgrade to successes when I can? It makes for interesting decisions that I really enjoy. That's a lot of talking. That's a lot of things. I hope it makes sense. Well, I think what really comes out of your explanation is not only how the right. game plays, but how much you enjoy it. I like it a lot. And it's because I'm a horde. Uh, a horge. You're a horde. <laughs> I'm a horge. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a huge horror fan. And they do such a good job paying homage to horror movies and different references to horror movies, which brings me to a Reddit thread that I found where somebody was breaking down the horror movie homages and where different things come from within the game. And I'm not going to go through the full exhaustive list because it's quite long. God bless this Reddit user. Yeah, they're great. I'm just going to go through it. Who is it? What's the Reddit user? Uh, the Reddit user is... Other wisely instead of otherworldly. Thank you, other wisely. This was posted seven months ago on the Final Girl subreddit, which I need to join. Joined. Uh, so, uh, just for a quick thing, so the Happy Trails Horror Camp Happy Trails. This person even says directly inspired by Friday the Thirteenth, which is very obvious. Uh, it says Hans is inspired by the slow moving Hulk type of slasher, Jason Michael Myers with a dash of Texas Chainsaw Massacre Saw Your Family and a sprinkle of spooky German vibes. Pretty accurate. Just like this beer, spooky German vibes. Exactly. Uh, this has German shame masks. Sean Maske were used in 17th century to punish those who acted inappropriately. Masks styled as pigs, which this guy's is, Hans is, were used for the gluttonous, drunken, or sloppy. And I don't know any historical facts. He has a link. I'm just not going to click it right now. Um, but if you look at it, it's obviously... Friday the 13th, it's obviously that kind of thing. But what I really like is uh, the two final girls are Lori Carpenter and Rako Rivers. Lori Carpenter, Lori's first name is a reference to Halloween, Lori Strode. And then her last name, Carpenter, filmmaker, John Carp Carpenter, who made Halloween, The Thing, Assault on Precinct 13, um, Precinct 13, there we go, and a lot of other movies. Reiko Rivers, it says Reiko is a common Japanese name, so there's a few possibilities, but most likely it's a reference to the protagonist of the original Japanese ring, which is Ringu. Uh, Rivers is possibly a reference to Clear Rivers, a character in the first two Final Destination movies, but there's no clarification there. He's done this with every single one. That's amazing. Haunting of Creech Manor, Slaughter at the Groves, Carnage at the Carnival, Frightmare on Maple Lane. If you Frightmare on Maple Lane, Nightmare on Elm Street, very easy thing there. My favorite part with that one is one of the characters is Nancy Lang. Nancy, because Nancy Thomas ah. is the main character. And Lang is probably because the actual actress is Heather Langenkamp. So it makes sense it's Nancy Lang. Anyway, the game is full of stuff like that, references to all these horror movies, and it just makes it uh, really fun as a horror movie fan and someone who likes to explore those, and, and I think it's just thematically they did just a really, really good job. Yeah, this is one that you're really passionate about, not only because you're a horror person, but also this has been a really fun solo game for you because you've played this many, 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 many times by Five yourself. Five times. Which is, a, which is quite a bit for you. Like, because yes. he, he got this game and usually Delton's a, let's play it once. I like it. Maybe we'll pick it up again before we, you know, uh, review it or whatnot but this time he sat down and literally played it five times in the last week i have and that's just because i have found it to be very fun and like i said the theme itself pulls me in a lot i want to play hostage negotiator to see if it has the same feel but i have a feeling that the theme of this one elevates it for me over what hostage negotiator would be even with the same mechanics but i find it to be very fun uh, i think it's worth looking into if anything just pick up the core box and the Camp Happy Trails 
and play that. Play through that scenario or that that board. You've got two final girls, one killer. It's difficult. It took me until my fourth try to finally beat it. I felt like I got super lucky on the rolls, and Hans, for some reason, was just uh, drawing kind of poorly. So in those in the different movie boxes, the location has a certain set of cards that go for the bad guy deck, and the killer has a certain set of cards to go for the bad guy deck. That way, if you're playing a new bad guy in a different location than the, the, than one that they come with, you can shuffle those together. Well, you only take 10 of those cards that are shuffled, and there's probably 30 cards that are shuffled. So you're getting a fraction of them, and some of those cards aren't as bad as others, depending on what's happening. Sometimes he just moves a lot. Sometimes it's the card that says things might be looking up and it's simply nothing happens, basically. Or you find an item or maybe a new event flips. Uh, every scenario, you get one event out. There's a chance for more. Events could be your boyfriend's here. Your girlfriend's here. Uh, there are more survivors just showed up out of nowhere and populated the camp. Uh, every survivor that the killer kills, they get stronger. So that's very, very bad for you, but also allows you to rescue more, which is a benefit to you. So there's all kinds of interesting things that can happen and ways that it could be more or less difficult and luck can be on your side sometimes. So keeping that in mind, uh, it's kind of a puzzle where you're trying to mitigate luck but also have fun in the process. And I think it just does a good job of being a difficult game that's fun and extremely thematic. I agree. It is really fun. I think that this is more of Delton's game than my game. Yeah. But we did find a way to have fun playing it together. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So the topic for today is multiplayer solo. Now, that is not to be confused with multiplayer solitaire. Multiplayer solitaire is all four of us are playing a game. Uh, a, a very good example of multiplayer solitaire would be, oh man, there's so Welcome many, to. Uh, sure, something like Welcome to, where your opponents don't matter. You don't care what they're doing for probably the entirety of the game. You just care about what's drawn so you can play your turn and use your stuff. Uh, it's multiple people playing a game, but they're all playing their own game by themselves at the table. Some people really hate that when there's no player interaction. I don't mind it one bit. I actually enjoy it. But multiplayer solo is more specific to multiple people, probably just two, playing a solo game at the same time. Together. Together. Forever. So the last time we did this was on Heading Forward, the John Dubois game from Holland Spiel. Episode 138. Oh, uh, there you go. Episode 138. Uh, we played that together where me and Haley sat down as a team and tried to play through the puzzle together, make decisions, talk about the game, and do that. Now, we've only done that one time with Final Girl just because life and timing, we ha didn't find our time to do our second one. But it was enough for me to show Haley the game, let her make some decisions and kind of show her because I found the first play of this game to be extremely difficult to understand why I'm doing something and how I should reserve my time, reserve my actions. So when I played with Haley, I, it was, I was trying to also explain to her the why of things, which probably didn't help when you're just like, this is a lot of stuff on the table, because I find that to be overwhelming when you're first learning a game, so that probably didn't help anything uh, for your brain. But it was a good way for us to sit down and me show her the game that I've been really enjoying, and for her to be able to play it and at least get a taste for what the game presents. And I feel like if you're going to do multiplayer solo games, there's a few ways that you can do that. One of them is kind of like our, the way that we tackle Lego sets. When we tackle Lego, set, Lego sets, he builds one page, I build one page. He builds one page, I build one page. You can definitely do a multiplayer solitaire where you're each taking turns, uh, making a move or making a play. But how we've done it so far in the times we've played multiplayer solitaire games is we very much have a discussion and collaboration before we make a decision. Multiplayer solo, not solitaire. Sorry, multiplayer solo, my bad. <laughs> Yes, we do. We play it to where we both look at the decisions in front of us and say, okay, what do we think we should do? And in terms of this game, since I had played it four times before, I told Haley, okay, I think we should do this or this. Which one sounds best to you to do first kind of thing? Or what do you think you want to do before we go do this or something? Uh, but that way it provides us room to have a conversation about what we think. It's not one player just playing the game while the other watches. 
and it provides both of us a way to have input and also make decisions for the game. I'm going to go on a slight tangent here. Mm -hmm. We are much better at collaborating and making decisions together whenever it comes to a board game. We can sit and make a decision together like yeah. for an hour to two hours and just have a grand old time. Not whenever we're trying to pick out a mattress. No, not at all. And that's because we have exact opposite needs for mattresses. Yeah, so just a little tangent. This week we've been trying to pick out a new mattress. And basically, I can sleep on a marble floor. And Delton is the princess who's sleeping on a pea. I've been having some bad shoulder and back pain for the past, how long? Three, four weeks. Uh, really, really badly to the point that it was like debilitating. I couldn't do much of anything without it hurting so much. And it was like my shoulder, uh, if you looked back at my shoulder blade, it was legitimately protruding versus my other side by a good inch, inch and a half. And some severe, severe pain. Uh, it, we've come to determine it's our stiff as a bored ass bed uh, because our bed is very worn down from the past eight years of sleeping on a uh, Japanese style futon mattress made of pure cotton. Uh, great when it was new. It's still been good, but it's finally just hit that point of I can't anymore. So in buying a new mattress, I want something that's going to be cushy and soft so I can just finally relax on a, f on a nice fluffy bed. And, and I'm a lizard on a rock. And Haley's like the little water bugs where she floats on top of everything. So a bed that's firm, support underneath, but with a cushy top, doesn't feel like it has support underneath. She just feels the cushy top. Yes. And so I think that we need to find a way to... Uh, apply our multiplayer solo game playing strategies to buying this mattress. Sure. I'm not going to go into all the details on the options we have and why I don't like them, but it's fine. Anyway, yeah, so multiplayer solo is all about, uh, for us, it's about making decisions together in a game. And I think that something fun about that is when you play a game together with somebody, making decisions together with somebody, it allows you to experience the game and it's almost like watching a movie or even doing a puzzle where you're watching the pieces come together. And obviously people do puzzles together, right? That's a thing. We do that until I get frustrated. I can't find the spot for a piece and I give up, which is common. And then you walk away and you go grab a drink and you come back and you're like, I don't know how you're doing that. And then you hover for about five minutes and then you say, oh, where's this piece go? And then, and then I just you get sucked back in. And then you stand there for about three minutes, putting in like two or three pieces, and then you sit down complaining about the puzzle, and then you're back into it. That sounds right. Yeah. That sounds right. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of how it is playing a playing a game solo, but with two people. It's like doing a puzzle, except there's something more fun about the experience of going through these things and watching stuff happen, whether it be your character dies, or if you win, it's just kind of fun to experience it, but. Also, more than that, at least for me, it's fun because I really like this game and it's a way for me to show you the game by forcing you to participate rather than just making you watch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so now I, 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 I did watch Delton play it, but also I got to experience it myself. A little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. For multiplayer solo, I feel like it's different too than cooperative games because co cooperative games, you're still making your own decisions even if it's for the same goal. This one, you're having to make a joint decision. And so I think it really takes a lot more uh, compromise and willingness to problem solve that we definitely don't apply to buying a mattress, but definitely do apply to board games. I mean, the, the, the big thing there is you could easily have one of the people be quarterbacking. One person could take the reins and say, no, that's stupid. We're doing this. So know yourself, know the person you're playing with and understand that if one of you has that tendency to just take over uh, in not a kind way, I guess is the way to put it, uh, take over in a way that's not as pleasant for the players that are playing. Understand that two people playing a single solo game, it's going to have the same issues that a cooperative game can have. However, if you're pretty good about letting people take their own turn and not really worrying too much about the actual fact of winning or anything like that and you're more just having fun sharing that like yeah somebody could make more decisions in the game let's say one person 75 percent versus 25 but as long as there's a discussion then the more experienced player generally will understand no here's why we should do this and can explain it as well um, but I, I think that there's a little more opportunity for discussion in a solo game because it's not 
you take your turn, I take my turn, here's how all this works. It's we take our turn, like you said. It does encourage a little more discussion, a little more cooperation for not being a cooperative style game. Uh, but I think that trying it is definitely worth doing. If there's a game you like that is only solo, which isn't a lot, or if there's a game that has a solo mode and you only really want to play it, or maybe you just want to introduce somebody to the game, like that's a really good way to do it and say, here, play this with me. We'll play the same player and you can see how it plays and we can have some fun and let them make decisions, let them roll the dice, let them hold the cards, let them you know, do half of the actions when you can. And I think that it's just a good way to involve somebody else in something that normally doesn't have another person involved. And that way, if you lose, you have someone other than yourself to blame it on. Exactly. Just like us, because we got owned in this we, game. We got owned. <laughs> yeah, together. we did. Woo. But multiplayer solo is just interesting. It's something that I've never been a solo game playing fan. We played heading forward and really liked the game because it was thought provoking. It was interesting. And the mechanics of the game were good. Final Girl is a theme that I absolutely adore and a game that thematically I think is fantastic. And I think that the game itself is very good, but being able to play it with you is nice because it's like watching a spooky movie with you. And just like watching a spooky movie, it might not be your favorite, but you're still going to sit there and, and participate with me and have fun with it. And I get to show you something I'm enjoying and we both still get to have a good time. So I like that. I do too. So even if Final Girl wasn't as it's not my favorite like it's one of Delton's favorites I think I think it's definitely uh risen to one of your your top ones yeah I still had fun I still enjoyed it and like Delton I also recommend it gives two clinks of approval clink clink but yes yeah, so highly recommend playing some multiplayer solo if there's a solo game that interests you let's move to the question now so we can wrap up this spooky Halloween episode in a spooky ending Ooh. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special bite-sized question. So, the question for today is thanks to Haley, and I remembered what it was only thanks to Haley making me type it in my spreadsheet before starting recording. I'm going to just point out here that before we started recording, we came up with the name of the question, or the question of the episode, and we're about to record, and I said, Delton, make sure you type it out in the spreadsheet, and he said, why? I don't need to do that through an absolute fit. Okay, it wasn't an absolute fit. <laughs> I said one sentence, and you're like, come on. I said, okay. Conniption fit, if you will. And then we uh, started the transition to the question. Tell says, what's our question again? Ha-ha! <laughs> it, it, it helped me out. I got it now. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. So the question of the episode is, what was your favorite house to trick-or-treat at as a kid? So there were two. I've talked about one before, and I might have talked about the other before, but we're going to go back. One of them was Mr. Warwick's house. Mr. Warwick always had homemade popcorn balls, and they were the absolute best. They weren't hard where they hurt your teeth. They were soft, but still crunchy the way they're supposed to be, and it was just the most delicious butter-filled popcorn ball, and you had to go there first, or they were gone like an hour, if not less, into trick-or-treating. Everyone knew to go to Mr. Warwick's house. So that was what the one. Uh, I recognized that one more when I was older. But the other one is there's a house by the elementary school, and you can actually go on YouTube and look up this old couple. They have a video where they were on... There used to be a channel or a segment on one of the news channels called Is This a Great State or What? And they go talk to this old couple. And this old couple always took pictures with the kids dressed up. And they had... I'm talking photo album on photo album on photo album going back decades where they always did this with all the different kids throughout the years. And I remember always taking a photo. And then I remember that when my mom would drop us off, she said, would say, now tell them that Tammy says hi or Tammy and Larry say hi. And you go do that. And she would say, okay, well, come with me. And she would take you to the kitchen and open the fridge. And she would have king size candy bars that she would give you. And it was the coolest thing when you're a kid. Uh, but it's actually really neat to see the old video and they have all these old books and photos of people. And I don't remember what years they passed away. Um, but the house is still there and it was just one of those cool houses to go to. What about you? That's a really sweet story, though. Gary, uh, I know that uh, Gary's had some hard years. <laughs> but yeah. it sounds like in the 90s it was a really fun place to go trick-or-treat, a good tight-knit place. 
the trick or treating was always great, but it was a very, I mean, it's a small town. Mom would be in the truck and she would let us walk about a block or so ahead and she would slowly creep and follow. And that's just small town vibe. When you're trick or treating as a kid in the late nineties, early two thousands, it was fun. Good times. Yep. So for me, and I know I've told this story before, but I think it's been a few years, but there was in my neighborhood growing up, uh, one of the neighborhoods we lived in, there was the guy who drove the Dr. Pepper truck. He did all the deliveries for Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and you would go to his house, and he never bought candy. But by God, he had a garage full of Dr. Pepper, and you'd go up, and you'd get a 20-ounce Dr. Pepper. And for me as a kid, anytime we got pop, like right, whenever my parents and I would buy us pop, yeah. or our parents would buy Riley and I pop, we always had the split one. We always had the split of Dr. Pepper, oh. and so we always had the share. And the problem was, Riley always wanted a Sprite, and because she was the youngest, she always got her way. So I always had to split a Sprite with my sister. But no, not on Halloween. I got a full-size 20-ounce Dr. Pepper to myself. That was my favorite house, and I still remember where he lives over on off Magnolia in Elk City. Thank you so much, Dr. Pepper Man, if you're listening. I'm sure you're not, but you really changed my life. You gave me my first full 20-ounce Dr. Pepper to myself, and I will always remember that. If childhood Haley was anything like modern day Haley, you took like four sips and were like, my tummy's full, it's too much <laughs> sugar. I can't handle this much sugar. And that's then all, you were done. That's because my parents made me split a pop all my life. <laughs> you can't handle it? I <laughs> thought, can't handle it. <laughs> I thought that that story was going to be uh, that he always had Dr. Pepper. And it, I didn't think it was going to be because you always had to split it. I thought it was going to be because we were so poor, we could only afford Dr. Thunder. Because oh, my yeah. grandma always had Dr. Thunder, and I didn't have Dr. Pepper until like quite a bit into growing up. And I'm sure you're probably the same with Sam, oh, yeah. Sam's Cola. We had Sam's Cola. We had Dr. Thunder. Yep. Absolutely, we did. Sometimes we had Mr. Pibb. But Mr. Pibb's still good. It is good. But yeah, I would go to his house for trick-or-treating. Awesome. He would open up his garage and get a full 20-ounce Dr. Pepper, and it was dope. You can't argue with awesome Halloween childhood candy stories. Nope. I like to go back. And so that's why Delton and I, we like to get uh, full-size candy bars. Yeah. And I think we should up the ante this year. I think we should also get two liters. No, not two liters. Yeah. Two liters are huge. They are huge. No, we're going to hand one to a kid, and some parent's going to give us the stink eye, and they're going to egg our house later in the night. It's not going to be as bad as last year whenever Dustin gave live goldfish. He did. Our neighbor gave literally bought like 200 goldfish and gave live goldfish in a bag to every kid that came up. And I was like, I think this is hilarious, but I am sad for the fate of 90% of these goldfish. As a vegan, I was very sad. Yeah. But as a child-free adult, I was it really was, happy. It was really funny. Uh, we did find out that they, at Walmart, sell for trick-or-treating. It is spooky Pokemon cards, and it's a booster pack of three cards that I think it has the weird, sketchy-looking Pikachu guy and maybe like a Gastler or a Gengar or a Haunter or something like that, but... Uh, I thought about getting those, too, because that'd be kind of cool. How's this compromise? We can give the parents a two-liter. No. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't think that's going to work. Come on. No, too too much soda. Also, expensive. Have you seen the cost of soda? We're going to have to go buy Sam's Cola. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Malthouse Games podcast. I want to give a big shout out to our amazing Patreon patrons. That is Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff. Thank you so much for supporting us on the podcast, on Patreon, uh, in which you get shouted out on the podcast. There are other levels you can go take a look at uh, if you want to, and I'm just now realizing that I don't know the last time I've posted on Twitter outside of advertising the podcast. You mean X. Uh, that's probably the problem, is I'm Xing it out of my brain. Uh, everything's fine. It's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you again for uh, to Tyler for uh, giving me a good deal on your Final Girl stuff because I wanted it for Halloween episode. I wanted it for this month's podcast. And also, I wanted it in general. Uh, so yes, if you have any game you think we should look at or any kind of topic you want us to cover, any question you want us to answer, make sure to send those to contact at malthousegames.com. Uh, I was going to say this and completely forgot till right now. So if you've stayed listening, good on you. Uh, if anybody wants this, and I'm going to give this an option to our listeners, I have a coupon code for 30% off of Calico on Steam. So if you play on your computer board games a lot, or if you have a Steam Deck, uh, it is 30% off of Calico. I can promise I have not used it because I don't own Calico. Uh, maybe I should check. I should probably check. All right, I have confirmed I do not own Calico. I have not redeemed this coupon. So I believe 
that it is still good. Uh, it's good until December 31st of 2026, and I have never used it. I believe that it came in the Kickstarter for Verdant. So uh, if you would like a 30% coupon for Calico, I have a single one. The first person to email email contact at malthousegames.com and tell me your favorite scary movie and tell me why you like it. And the first person that can get that done, uh, if you want it, let me know. I will send you this coupon code so you can get a 30% discount on the Steam version of Calico. Or if you just want to tell us what your favorite scary movie is, that's cool too. Then I, I will not be opposed. But yeah, so I think that's going to cover everything for this episode. Uh, thank you so much again for tuning in and listening to the Malthouse Games podcast. Until next time. You forgot the... Uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Follow Malthouse us Games. on all social media at Malthouse Games. Follow Haley at S Q U I R R E L Y G E K, and you'll find me more active on Instagram nowadays than the Twitter X. That is at Squirrely Geek. Uh, yes, Instagram is more active. That yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> and so if you follow me on Instagram, I do have a private account. Uh, make sure to message me and tell me that you are a fellow board gamer, so I know who you are, and I will add you back on Instagram. And you can follow her okay at hiking and watch her hiking stuff whenever we get to go. Yeah. Yeah, but okay, that's everything. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Have a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs>